Good evening, everybody. It's 6.02. My name is Tamar Russell Brown. I'm from Gallery Sitka, and we are in Shirley, Massachusetts. And we put on a little show this summer called Harvest, celebrating this time of year because it's beautiful and wonderful and lots of food is prepared and produced and grown. And it was juried by three women. We were really appreciative to have them help us. Elizabeth Whelan, Jennifer Okumura, and Pat Garrick all helped us um, with jurying the work. And we have a wonderful group of women that are in this show. It's an online show. If you go to gallerysica.com forward slash harvest, you'll see the entire show. And on the website, you can see all the different artists that were chosen to be part of this show. And the nice thing is that a lot of them are from the Women's Caucus for Art group, which has a central Massachusetts chapter. And Carolyn is a member of that chapter. So tonight we have Carolyn Todd with us. And we're going to be talking to her about her career as an artist and her life. And then we'll show some of her work on the screen. So if we, I can just do a few housekeeping things, we're going to hold questions to the end. And we have Doreen Lascala, who's a local artist here. She'll take the questions at the end. And we'll keep you on mute until then. Um, but Doreen will be the one to ask the questions. And if anybody would like to make a comment, certainly you're welcome to come on the screen too. And we're streaming this live on Facebook. So we are filming and your faces will be there if you decide to come on. So Carolyn, um, I wanted to ask you a lot about your life actually. And you do sound like my mother, like in my aunts with the accent, I love it. So could you tell us Carolyn where you're from? I'm from Austin, Texas. And I can't hide the accent, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to apologize. We like variety, that's fun. So could you tell us a little bit about your background, Carolyn, in terms of your education and your love of the arts? Because obviously I can see that you love them. I do. I do. And uh, again, I feel very fortunate to be here. Tamara, thank you so much for all that you do for all of us. We appreciate you. I do. Um, I grew up in Austin, Texas. Uh, my great grandfather was a a truck driver and a stonemason. He had built the capital there. So we go back several generations. Austin's changing a great deal. Um, in fact, I saw one of the, I have to just take a little sideways here. I saw a news, lots of stuff on the news these days. And um, it showed red and blue states, but it showed Texas as a gray state. And I was absolutely thrilled. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I went to, I was fortunate in the seventh grade to be selected for a gifted program in the arts at the University of Texas in Austin. So I started going to the university when I was in the seventh grade. And the incredible uh, faculty uh, members that participated and designed the program, uh, I was working with models, live models, and uh, just having great experiences in seventh grade and uh, continued until, until I graduated from high school. And I was fortunate to re receive a scholarship to attend there. And I received my Bachelor of Fine Arts in, in the Fine Arts. And I also decided to go th and get the uh, teaching certificate too. So if, I always enjoyed teaching a great deal. And I was a student teacher within that program while I was, was there in my college years. Um, we moved to Houston, and Houston uh, has large, uh, large school, large campuses, uh, different towns, and I was fortunate to get my master's there. And I kind of made it, it was a, a fairly new campus, and I was able to put my three interests, the studio arts, art education, and art history together for that, uh, that master's program. So I was very fortunate in that respect. So Carolyn, what was your working career? Your, the, once you finished your education, were you in education? What item, what types of work have you done? I, I did teaching, I uh, did in the Austin Public Schools, um, um, uh, middle school for several years. Um, I, when we moved to Houston, I worked for the Contemporary Arts Museum in uh, Houston, teaching for them. Uh, they had an outreach program to the schools, and uh, I enjoyed that tremendously. Uh, I also worked on that while in graduate school, so that was, was great. Um, 
Uh, I did certainly several years of freelance work. I worked with printers. I worked uh, for a printer for several years. That's why I'm kind of excited about your letterpress interest. I certainly was exposed to some of that for several years. And uh, but but again, also working as an artist, showing in galleries and as much as I could throughout the state. Um, I enjoyed, we had an encaustic group there for a while and I loved encaustic painting. And uh, we connected with different uh, chapters throughout the state. So therefore we had shows from the Panhandle down through the coast all over the state. It was incredible. So that was a great few years there. Um, and um, I was always interested. I was an art therapist for a while, started right after, right during graduate school. And um, I became very interested in the role that art can play in art therapy, certainly with people with disabilities. Um, schizophrenia was one of my main interests. So my clients uh, were struggling with that. And I used art therapy and that was fantastic. I eventually became a counselor for people with disabilities with the state, and that's how I retired. But all, again, during those years, I was also teaching free and, and also doing freelance uh, artwork as much as I could. But um, I've always had a place in my heart for people with disabilities and, and their art and their understanding of it and observing them and appreciating them was an education, certainly for me. So I spent yep. several years with that. You have a really long career in the art, actually. I think so. Yeah. I still, I'm still teaching. <laughs> I teach at the Pittsburgh Art Museum, the Pittsburgh State University's Alpha program, which is a continuing ed program, and I dearly love it. It's so fantastic. Don't have to do grades. <laughs> and uh, Creative Minds, Seven Hills, with Worcester Art Museum. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, I've seen your name around. Actually, I saw it on something from Fitchburg State just the other day. So it's really wonderful to see. So you've only been here a short time in Massachusetts. You said four years it is, is it? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And how is it that you connected with the Women's Caucus for Art chapter? Well, it was kind of fascinating. Um, and I'm sorry at the moment, their, their name escapes me, but um, the, the Arts Council the, in Fitchburg, they had a meeting at the museum uh, one day and about the arts and the arts in that, you know, the Pittsburgh area. I, I was, I'm a docent there and I had just finished being a docent for a group. And so I, somehow I, I managed to get invited in, <laughs> probably because I was hanging around and, do, and doing this kind of stuff. So that I get to sit in and, and learned a lot about that and those folks there. And uh, a lady from our, this wonderful group I'm in with Gail and so many others, uh, she was there and we got to talking and she gave me some information. That's wonderful. And I wanna put in a plug for the Fitchburg Cultural Council. It's a entity that's basically, the seats are appointed by the mayor of each or by, by the community. And it's funded by the state. The Massachusetts Cultural Council is the overriding mothership. And the state doles out so much money for the arts every year. And a percentage of that is given to each community um, based on need. And the council decides how the funds are used. And one of the things the council is supposed to do is to have an open session where they get feedback from the arts community about what the arts community needs. So what you attended, that's what that event was. Mm -hmm. And just so everyone in Massachusetts knows, the council gets uh, grant funding every year and the cycle usually starts in the fall. The cycle this year starts October 1st. And we don't know how much uh, funding Fitchburg is gonna get yet. We're all kind of waiting to see. Um, but I would invite everybody to come attend. The meetings are on Zoom. And the next one is Monday night at 4.30. So definitely something, I didn't know that's how you met these women. So that's really yeah. amazing and um, interesting. So I did want to ask also, I would like to hear about your like letterpress and design work. That would be kind of fun to hear about. But I also wanted to hear about, um, for those of us who are, I've been living in New England a long time, although I'm from the South. And the South, as we discussed, is different from the West, Southwest. So I'd like to ask about how the Southwest, the 
lifestyle, the scenery, how that factors into your art making? I think that's a fantastic segue. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I am a naturalist. Um, I had been since a child, grew up camping. My parents were into camping, uh, went all over the state. And I became fascinated with Texas animals, birds, but particularly reptiles. And I'm a, 30, a little over 30 year volunteer with Texas Parks and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife. And um, over the years I became kind of a, I don't know what the word would describe, uh, um, someone very interested in the three species of horn lizards there and I actually uh, kept them in captivity for parks in my life. Anyway, it, that opportunity with studying those, becoming a naturalist in that, in a real sense of uh, trying to help them and get with organizations and zoos and relocating them to areas where they've lost habitat. So all those years, um, again, all over the state, participating in surveys with not only rep the horn lizards, but certainly other reptiles and amphibians. And uh, the, state, the state has lots of those in incredible areas. Uh, we were invited on private ranches, sometimes 600 acre ranches to survey for landowners that wanted, um, if they had threatened species, they could get federal protections from in assistance with that. So I enjoyed that tremendously. So a lot of my art certainly um, is inspired by those environments, those animals, and uh, with particular interest in animals um, and habitats and plants, some plants too that have become threatened and endangered. We're losing many species every day worldwide. So I guess my heart and soul, the things I approach, is trying to develop a relationship with the viewer that they sense or feel something in that respect. The nature, the habitats around us, how it affects everything we do. And to bring about a memory that might stay with them. And if I can have that in any small way with the viewer, then maybe somehow we extend that interest into that situation, that animal, that habitat, that they can also be a participant in some way by seeing my inspiration and that I share it with the viewer is, is my primary approach, I believe. That's really interesting, Carolyn. I did not know that based on what, you're, what you wrote for us for, the, for this show. That's really important, actually, um, which is environmental art, isn't it? I, I think so. I'm, I'm quite proud of that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I heard from, from my fellow members in, in the group, um, that harvest time here is a very, you know, a very positive thing. Uh, but in Texas, uh, September is usually, and harvest is a difficult time. My dad grew up uh, in the Depression, and they had to, at times, go and uh, help in the harvest of cotton. And uh, harvesting cotton is extremely difficult. And my dad insisted that myself and my sisters experience that twice when we were growing up. And you go out and it's, it is extremely hot when you're pulling those cotton bulbs and those uh, fragments there are very sharp. And so I guess at an early stage, to me, the harvest is a time of struggle and of, of, you know, people are trying to survive and hoping that the harvest will be a positive one. When a lot of times in Texas, it's not necessarily. It's a risky kind of time of year because if the rain comes too low, it can destroy crops. But if it doesn't come at all, it can, crops can be destroyed. So. To me, the harvest is a time of intense um, survival and um, a struggle. So in Texas, can you tell us a bit about the land? 
what things would be grown there, what things people would be harvesting besides cotton this time of year? Um, sure. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of changes because, you know, like everything else, farming has become very uh, contemporary and very technical in a lot of respects. Um, uh, certainly they, they raise corn there, but not like we do in, in different parts of the United States that they get the nice rich corn. They grow it, they call it maize, and it's mainly for feed. So um, in the late summer, of course, harvest time is also hay, a lot of hay. A lot of ranchers and farmers raise that because it's easier. A lot of those uh, parts of the, of the hay come from different grasses that are more resistant to soil that's not real rich or that, of course, during drought, so they're a little more resistant. Um, those are the ones I tend to be the most familiar with uh, in, in terms of central Texas. East and west are, are different because the climates are a little bit different. It's a little bit wetter in the east than it is in the west. And another question I had for you off topic a little bit, um, are you familiar with the native populations in Texas? Are there large populations of natives? Yes, um, I was a part of a powwow that was held in Austin every year. I had several friends there and uh, enjoyed attending the powwow. I also lived in Del Rio uh, for 18 months. I worked for a university there. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, Plains Indians folks were there. And uh, I had two uh, folks that worked for me and they had very rich family lives and they were ex very exciting to get to know. I enjoyed them. One was Apache and uh, she brought her grandfather's drum to work one day and we all had a great time. It was fascinating. Really interesting. That's something that I think we don't think about enough here in this part of the country. You know, this was actually a rich region with native people at one time. And certainly I know from the Western part of the state, the Pioneer Valley was very, it was rich farmland and fishing and also hunting. And so a lot of native people were there. I think the white man learned about corn from them too, right? That was absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It comes from this country. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So the piece that you have in this show, I thought we will look at it now. Let me share my screen and you can tell us a little bit about it, Carolyn, will that work? Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about this work? The colors are certainly rich. Yeah, um, again, when I kind of approach of it on a, a topic like harvest, I'm thinking again that harvest is a process. It starts out with the seed and how that's developed and kind of the different stages and the struggle that all that goes through. And I tend to think in abstract terms. I do uh, representational art uh, as it inspires me. But in this particular kind of uh, theme of harvest, to me, I'm thinking of the plains and I'm thinking of all the challenges that result can be distant at times. And again, it's all about those colors and how that whole process happens before anything's ready for harvest is, is kind of what goes through my mind. Is again, the struggle, the, the underground, as the growth appears and then somewhat of a positive result, hopefully. But the entire thing is more of that struggle of, from a beginning process through, the, through, through to the end. And that's what I was painting. That's really interesting. It's so interesting coming from here, right? Where this time of year tends to be completely, I mean, it's a lush region because we have so much greenery here. Um, it's so interesting the difference right and I see I see now a lot clearer what you were meaning so I'm going to move to the next one I'll let you tell us about them this is another piece by Carolyn yes I'm not afraid of you yes <laughs> you know that's that's of course this is kind of a COVID thing what can I say it is <laughs> that's okay um, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's to me like the dark versus the light forces and the struggle. And when I painted that, I had been watching the news and, and just profoundly affected by all that. And I sat down and I painted that. And it's kind of funny at one point, um, 
Helen Frankenthaler has always been one of my favorites. Uh, you're studying her undergraduate and graduate. And for some, for some reason, when I was painting it, she was rushing through my brain uh, along with Georgia O'Keeffe. And of course, I admired Georgia O'Keeffe since I was in junior high myself. And uh, that interpretation of color and line and kind of fearlessness that they both of these particular artists had, and, and of course, kind of an environmental, to say the least, certainly of Georgia O'Keeffe influence was rushing through my brain and I just couldn't stop it. And I wanted to say something about this agent that's so evil and threatening, and that's what happened. And this is the result. Yes. This is real art in action, right? Yes. You have, you have something to say and you say it visually. That's the wonderful thing about art. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's have a look at this next one. Oh, yes. Who is this guy? Uh, this is um, a painting of, a, of a, a particularly threatened animal called an ocelot in South Texas. Um, because I was a long-term volunteer for Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, they had several grants for trying to study this particular animal. And a couple of my friends um, through Parks and Wildlife uh, were studying them in South Texas. And this particular animal was injured by a driver and uh, was rescued and uh, rehabilitated and, and released. And it just, that story was so gorgeous and it was a gorgeous female. And um, I used some of their uh, research photographs to, to paint her. So occasionally, it's kind of funny in the art world, you know, you have groups that think, um, you know, well, once you kind of pass over into the abstract world, you're, you never go back to where it was. And I, I, don't, I don't like the term realism. I never have. Realism is, you know, this mouse. <laughs> to me, it's I'm representing. I am influenced. I'm uh, inspired by this animal and its struggle. So I painted her. And I used photographs because when I heard about her, she had already been released. So just uh, enjoying her was, was part of that inspiration. Yeah, it's beautiful. So you kind of cross between realism and abstract. In some ways I do. Um, this is an encaustic painting. Are you familiar with encaustic painting? Yeah. Yes, I am. So how did you do that? You want to talk to us a little bit about that? I am. We used to have uh, two encaustic painters with us. We don't have anyone at the moment. Uh, oh. But yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about that process? What it means? It's a very ancient art. It is. It's actually the oldest of all. It goes back to uh, the paintings in Lascaux and um, Altamiris. I was, my husband and I were fortunate to visit the cave in uh, Altamira, Spain. And uh, it's called the, chap, you know, the Sistine Chapel of the Caves, because all the paintings are on the ceiling. And uh, they used wax to adhere to the limestone. So uh, I like to give, I give an art history talk on encaustic and I have lots of slides in PowerPoint um, showing kind of the evolution of the medium because a lot of different plants and animals are part of that process. But this one of course is using uh, beeswax, damar raisin and oil paint and you I work, well, I don't like working with torches because I've also taught encaustic and I've just decided that torches in a classroom, not a good idea. <laughs> so I, I, I use heat guns instead and I have a lot more control, I think, with a heat gun. Uh, but it's working with the molten medium. The paint, oil paint is melted with the beeswax and the damar rosin and you paint with it like anything else except that you have to keep it molten with the heat gun. And all of this is encaustic. And uh, now let's see. So um, it's, it's challenging in some ways because the painting of it is just very, very different than traditional oil painting. But I've always said, you know, uh, when that wax cools, you have, a, you have an oil painting. Now it does, ha I will say it has to cure uh, for the wax to harden. Um, it's funny, when I do encaustic paintings, I always put a little, um, note on the back of the painting 
Uh, because in Texas, whenever we would have shows, people would always come up and say, well, if I put it in my house, will it melt on the wall in the Texas summer? And I would be a little amused and I'd say, well, if your house gets to 160, 170 degrees, <laughs> I think you've got other problems than your paintings melting. <laughs> sometimes they would think that was funny, sometimes they didn't. Uh, but I did assure them by this label on the back to not include the painting in the trunk of a card in the summer might be a good idea. Yes, that's exactly it. And that's how I learned actually about encaustic painting. We have one woman um, in Groton, Jeannie, who um, has worked with us over the years. And that's one of her in instructions to me in transporting things. They can't be left in the car, and especially in the summer, in the heat with the windows up, because it just won't, it's just mm -hmm. not work. And it's they, yeah. and, like she makes sculptures. So, you know, if, if you're not careful, the sculpt, it's eat more easily dented than a sculpture that's out of, you know, marble or bronze. Right, well that's, example, that's actually a good point because you can't paint on canvas with encaustic. The reason why you can't paint on canvas is that canvas moves and it would crack it, you know, if you had to move the painting a lot. So we paint, encaustic artists, I believe most of us do, paint on panel, cradled panels, which is what this is. Yeah, and it's, it's surprising because unless you look close, or you saw this in person, it's hard to tell on the screen that it's encaustic. Very interesting. And how did you get this, the line? Do you have a process for separating the colors so that they don't ble bleed into each other? Well, um, again, it's, it's really, I guess the best word pops in my head is managing the temperature at all times. I would usually, the darker lines, they would go down first and I would have them think, I'm also a watercolorist, so I like sometimes to glaze colors. So these oranges in here are glazed with encaustic. So therefore, they're, they have more um, of the beeswax in them as compared to the oil paint. So you're glazing the color. So it, of course, is, it, molten much faster than the darker blacks that are also, th if, if you saw the painting up in front of you, it's very, the paint and the wax is very thick. So the black is much thicker, again, because it won't melt as fast as the glazing. That makes sense. Yeah, I like how you've got the, the line is really, it's almost graphic in a sense, the line around the animal. Yes. I yeah. like it. She's beautiful and she's wild. I hope she's still out there. I hope so too. <laughs> All right, let's see what we have next. The next one we have, how do you, it's Organtuan and Caustic. That's just the title. Is that the right title? Or orangutan. Orangutan. Yeah. Okay. It's Tell us about this one. Is this encaustic as well? Yes, it is. I'm just moved by how severely endangered orangutans are becoming in loss of habitat. And um, in thinking in terms of taking an animal through abstraction, in my mind, I'm trying to create a memory of a color of that particular animal, how it's breathing, how it's moving, and how we may lose them. And I think in terms of this approach, I'm hoping on the viewer would have a stronger impact in the sense than a more representational because again, sometimes representational pieces, um, people get kind of lost in that and, and don't really build that memory of that understanding. So I'm thinking the reds and the colors and that movement that defines an animal in the wild, we're losing it. So that is my approach in painting it in the abstract is to create that memory so somehow it reaches out to the viewers that understand that animals and reptiles and birds um, we're losing, we're losing that memory. So have you been doing this kind of environmental art for a long time, Caroline? I have, I have. I've painted, a, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny in some ways. Um, 
uh, people, maybe not just in Texas, but are very phobic about reptiles. And I'm sorry, but that's the best word that comes to mind. I had a pain, I, I studied um, several of the rattlesnakes for parks and wildlife, always fascinated. I helped them uh, in capturing them for film extraction in West Texas near Big Bend. Have you ever heard of Big Bend National Park? I have. Yay! I haven't <laughs> been there, but I've heard of it. Excellent. Hopefully you'll make it someday. Uh, a lot of wonderful snakes are around Big Ben, to say the least, and uh, they have to have venom extraction. So anyway, we'd go out there. Well, I took photographs, and, and I thought would be very interesting, again, this memory, this recollection of the patterns on the reptiles that define them. So I did several watercolors, uh, and I took them to the office, and I put them on the wall, and uh, I had two clients come in and said they couldn't come in and sit down. And I was surprised. I said, you can't, you can't come in and sit down. And they said, well, yeah, you have that snake on the wall. And I said, it's a water, water color. I promise you it won't bite you. I didn't include them because I was afraid we might have the same responses. Sorry. <laughs> I think that would be fine. <laughs> Well, I'm scared of them. I'll be honest. The water moccasins, especially, that's where I where I come from. They're always in the creeks, you know. Where, they where, are. Yes, with, they are. Oh, yeah. No, well, I'm happy some people love them. <laughs> so you're, you're a blessing to have around, Carolyn. I'll have to tell you a water moccasin story I have sometime. It's, uh, it's very interesting. I'll tell you someday. Is it a Texas water moccasin? Oh, it is. Oh, in nesting season, no less. Well, tell us the story. We'll take the oh, story. No, I might upset some people. I don't want to do that. All right. No problem. <laughs> All right. Let's look at the next one. Uh, this was why I was artist in residence for the Park Service. Um, this was uh, a plein air watercolor I did. It's, um, it's a ranch that was, uh, oh, it's about 2,000 acres. It took me two hours from the highway to reach the Devil's River. Have you ever heard of the Devil, Devil's R River by any chance? No, I have not. It's, uh, it empties into like Amistad, which uh, is on border with Texas and Mexico. Anyway, it was a gorgeous, incredible private ranch. And um, because I was an artist in residence with the Park Service, uh, they have this cooperation with the uh, Nature Conservancy. And this uh, landowner is a uh, uh, active in, in both groups and he allowed me on his ranch and this is a cliff that was right next to the Devil's River and it was a uh, incredible magic place it was kind of funny after I painted that I went to my truck and I noticed one of the time I was by myself in a canyon uh, on the Devil's River and uh, which is a very gorgeous beautiful but very dangerous river Anyway, so I, I noticed my tire was almost flat. And about that time on the other side, of, on the Mexican side, the storm was coming up over the canyons. So I ran, grabbed everything, jumped in my truck, and the storm actually followed me into town. And uh, with a almost flat tire, I got there just in time to have my tire changed. I was a little hesitant to try and, and, and you know, pot, fix it on the highway there because it was just a really very fast, quick little hailstorm and it, a little dangerous to be stopped on the side of a road for a flat. So I was fortunate to make it into town. So that particular scene is always reminds me of my flat tire. <laughs> How could you forget? Absolutely. How, how long were you an artist in residence? It was just, uh, it, it was, they had, it was kind of funny. It was a new program. Uh, it was outside of uh, Del Rio, and uh, it was about eight months. Uh, they weren't quite sure. It was, it was really funny. They, they first, they, part of the deal was to have a studio uh, close to the, where the parks were, and they gave me this uh, room that was a headquarters for the Border Patrol. And uh, so it was kind of funny to be in there painting and talking to them, but I learned a, a great deal of of what those folks have to do with the Border Patrol. That's really interesting. It's an interesting program for a state to have, actually. Well, this was through the National Park Service. National, okay. Yeah. So is that, a, is that common, that there's people are, are um, 
are part of a program like that? Around? I, again, it was a very, very new problem. I think I was only the second one chosen. So it was a brand new program. I uh, kept up with it for a while and, and they've, as far as I know, have continued it. That's really wonderful. I've never heard of that. It was. To have the thing about it that was so wonderful was having access to the, these private ranches and, and uh, because there's a lot of private property out there and to really get into the nature and, and see everything. It's, uh, it's great to have that relationship between the, the Park Service and the Nature Conservancy and private landowners. So what happened with the work that you made during that time? Uh, the uh, Park Service, uh, there was an art group in town in Del Rio, and they occupied a restored um, uh, fire station. And um, they gave me a solo show, and uh, I sold out 85% of the show. Wow. So there's a lot of support for and, 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 in West Texas, it's, it's a community thing. Uh, when they would have these art walks on Friday nights, that would be when the solo shows would launch. And uh, literally, people from the entire town came to the opening. I had a Mariachi fan. It was wonderful. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun, Carolyn. I love it, this. this it was. It was. Is this piece of watercolor? Yes, it is. I'm sorry, it is. Yeah, it's really beautiful. So how interesting, Carolyn. Quite, quite a, like, it's very different speaking to you, having this Western bend to your art career and your life. It's really interesting. Yes. And if, can you tell us a little bit, just because I'm curious, a little bit about Austin, the city where you're from? Um, well, again, we uh, several generations have gone up there. I have a picture of my great-grandfather who shot a deer on Congress Avenue. And the Capitol, of course, he was a stone mason, a truck driver for the Capitol. Um, so I, I grew up there. I saw it just continue to grow. Um, and it's grown very, very fast. Uh, we were just, uh, my husband and I were just visiting with my uh, brother and sister-in-law before tonight, before talking with you. And uh, they're still bemoaning the traffic is just horrendous. I mean, so many people have moved into that due to the Austin area. It's become very popular because of the music industry and, and tech industry is there also. Um, there, uh, Apple is, I've been told Apple is about to have a huge uh, you know, building and, and increasing their size and profile in Austin and some other organizations too um, in the tech industry and the music industry is pretty strong there. I, we were talking earlier, if you don't mind me mentioning, oh, good old Willie. I, Willie, I think, got some of the credit. He did a lot of musical shows there growing up and was very popular. And whenever Willie goes out in, anywhere, he always attracts people that come in to follow him. And he was known for his um, golf co course that he owned. And he would, it was really kind of funny, they would ride around on either horses or golf courses and they would just almost polo play the golf. And he would have people come and watch him in a, in a kind of a desert environment, very dry, not like you think of a golf course. And Willie would have his, his golf tournaments, he called them. He was quite, he's quite a character, still is. <laughs> Willie, uh, everybody, that's who she's talking about, Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson, oh, Willie, yeah. So a lot of musicians, a lot of famous musicians have come to Austin and continue in the big large someday I'm, I'm i'm sure they're all hoping that'll start ha it'll happen again and certainly uh you uh they show austin city limits on tv different channels here so that reflects a lot of music in in austin and so what is the art scene like in texas there's certain are there certain towns certain places that are special uh well of course the um we had a lot of shows in Houston and um, Dallas, Fort Worth area. The big cities have the large museums. Like I told you earlier, I worked for the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. Um, they, as, as far as the kind of larger audiences, the larger profiles in the bigger cities, Austin um, has the Blanton, which, is, which sits on the University of Texas and uh, is certainly affiliated with them, uh, but it's, 
this pretty small kind of museum as far as art museums go. So again, larger cities, um, I mean, this area has been quite a experience for me that, you know, it seems like most of the towns have art museums or art communities, and I'm just fascinated that the profile here and the interaction with the communities is just so incredible. Certainly, I've been fortunate to, to learn a lot of that through the Fitchburg Art Museum and all the fabulous, wonderful people that work there. I've been very fortunate. So it's very, I think the arts, fine arts certainly have a much larger profile uh, in communities than in Texas. I think it's improving in Texas. It's just been a little slower process, maybe. Uh, but it's, it's definitely grown and gotten much bigger uh, with, with galleries. Some of them are community galleries. So again, very different. I think the art uh, profile here is much bigger and stronger and more active. Um, but it's just very different. The appreciation approach to art is also very different here. And it's been a great education for me so far. Mm -hmm. Hope to learn more. <laughs> Yeah, I was definitely coming from the South, Carolyn. That's another thing that I noticed mm -hmm. as well here. Um, people could say whatever they'd like to say about Fitchburg, but to have a community this size that has its own art museum is really quite exceptional, quite surprising. Mm -hmm. you know, coming from the South, we had, I don't even, so there was an art scene certainly to now in Nashville there is, which is the closest city to where I grew up in my father's city. But in our community, there wasn't really much of an art scene at all. Um, we didn't have art education in school. Um, so if you wanted that type of education, you had to get that you know, outside of school. You hired someone privately. And I had fam my immediate family had year, you know, generations of painters in the family um, coming from Nashville, but they had always left the South to get education elsewhere. So it's kind of, and there was an art school, a tiny one, but it's really completely, the, the Northeast is definitely different. And I was curious about Texas. I know there's pockets of the Southwest where there, there's a large art scene. Um, I think Marfa even, is it Marfa, Texas? I'm not. Marfa, yes, it's West Texas, near Alpine and Fort Davis. Been there, seen a lot of that. And, and that's been well over the last 30 years years maybe, particularly the last 20, but that's become um, a lot of artists have moved there and enjoy that uh, environment. It is, it is gorgeous. It is much stronger in, in the desert in terms of location-wise because it's pretty far. But for me, it's just, it's, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous place. But again, a lot of them kind of work there because they enjoy the environments, but they, they show in the larger cities. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Sort of like I think from this region too, people do, you, the larger cities is where the, the bulk of the activity goes, even if you're living in a smaller community. But we're pretty fortunate here to have what we have here in terms of the art community and the, the museums in all these towns. And um, even, even Brattleboro, another one small town, has an art museum yes. and galleries. It's really special. Yes, it's been fascinating to me, just amazing to me. <laughs> they have so much art everywhere. It's just incredible. Well, thank you, Carolyn. So we're going to open it up to, um, we have 15 minutes left. We're going to see if anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question. Doreen, do we have any comments anywhere? Hi, uh, yes, we do. Um, I'm going to start with Susan. And um, she started with a comment and it finished up with the question. And the collection piece seems to be both underground in the top portion, but aerial in the lower part. The right reads as a river for, for me, is what she said. How often, how often crazy is this interpretation? Carolyn, I'm gonna flip the screen again and let you respond. <laughs> Um, I don't think it's crazy at all. I, th I think it's pretty <laughs> accurate, really. I mean, that's what a process is. That you know, it it starts internal, and it grows, and it struggles. I think that's a great interpretation. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Anything else, Doreen? Yeah, from the Gallery Sixty East site, we have Linda Cucciarulo, 
who said fantastic, fascinating stories, and she would like to know how Carolyn ended up in this part of the country. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, came to this area. My youngest grandson is a heart patient at Boston Children's. Um, he was born with a reasonably severe heart defect or heart condition. And he's had two uh, open heart surgeries. And um, we came up here to be with our family, my husband and I both after we retired and to help them out and help Nathan out. And uh, we were there when he had his uh, operation at Boston Children's. He is a patient there and uh, it's just an incredible, wonderful place. And that's how I wound up in this part of the country. <laughs> And we're happy that you came here. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really wonderful to have you. It's nice to have um, an influx of artists to any place. It helps the community to be successful, I think. It helps the young people to have something to aspire to and to have a good education. That's really important. Anything else, Doreen? Do we have anybody else? Um, actually, just myself <laughs> on the orangutan case. Yes. Uh, Carolyn, I noticed a lot of very fine lines, so I'm um, a little curious as to um, how you approach that, what you use for a lot of the, the very fine line in the encaustic. Um, you can see that the lower portion, I, I use the natural color of the wax. I usually build up the uh, foundation of the wax about an inch thick or so because um, not only do I enjoy painting on it, I also enjoy carving the wax. Unfortunately, photography, uh, Tamar, excuse me, but there, you know, photography doesn't help in caustic much. I'm sure you probably <laughs> understand because it flattens it. It just flat, you know, all that carving I've done and pulling that color, I sometimes will layer it so I can carve into the different colors. Uh, that's what's so incredible about what, uh, encaustic because of that wax. And like I said, I have a PowerPoint. I even talk about the different waxes uh, that were used by the Pecos people that did encaustic in West Texas. Anyway, um, to answer your question, um, some of that is, is embedded black into the wax first. I carve it in and then I paint the black. So the black becomes, uh, I call them hills and valleys sometimes. The students, it comes in there and it's embedded into the wax base and then I can paint around it or over it uh, with the color. And does that make sense? Am I making sense, Doreen, so far? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And, I wasn't sure if it was, it almost looked like um, more of a drawing tool, so that's what made me um, curious about it. Yeah, so, no, yeah. all the paint is applied with, with brushes of, of different sizes, of course, um, but um, like what when I'm, I also love to do the glazing. I think I mentioned that earlier, the glazing technique with encaustic, which is so spectacular. You can make that paint as, as thin or as thick as you want. You can paint it like watercolor, or you can paint it a very impasto, very thick. And I like to do both. And by th building the wax substrate up, that allows me again to carve into it uh, to help those lines and that color get embedded into those hills and valleys. So then I paint over it and it's, it tends to give that, that feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm saddened that you can't see uh, the carving in there, but uh, anyway, it's uh, an incredible medium. I just love it, I love it. I actually can see a little bit. That's a beautiful piece. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Photography um, doesn't do it. This is, well, this is the whole thing about, you know, having shows and galleries in person. We've had to change because of COVID, but I mean, especially in caustic, like to see something in person and like everyone always wants to touch it too. That's the other thing. They're like, can I touch that? Because you can see the texture, like it's so rich, the texture. Yes. And to do that with paint, you actually need a lot of paint, you know, to build up that kind of texture but encaustic has it naturally. Like it's just it's, very cool. it's a, And it's just, it's just incredible the things you can do. It's just unlimited. All the incredible stuff you can do with it. The, and it's, you know, I will say, sometimes people have, have 
approach me and, and been dismayed a little bit of the prices. Uh, sometimes, and caustic does cost a little more than, than a traditional oil painting or watercolor because it's very medium rich because of that uh, interest in building that texture. Like I said, I usually make mine a half an inch to an inch thick, depending on what I'm doing. And uh, with all the paint and stuff, it's very time consuming, very technique driven. Um, when I was teaching, I was always very careful with the heat guns. Of course, I didn't use torches as we were talking about earlier, because I always thought that was a little bit more of a hazard. But the only one that ever burned her, herself with one of the heat guns was me, because I wasn't paying attention. That heat gun, that tip of that heat gun gets pretty hot. So um, I never had any accidents, thank goodness. And, and hopefully we'll continue someday. But I do, of all the mediums, it's my very favorite, but it is expensive. So uh, unfortunately that makes the final price sometimes be a little expensive too, but uh, I enjoy it. I think it's incredible, just you, a, a paint medium that you can carve into it and make all kinds of infinite textures and line quality. You can make it disappear. You can make it uh, scream at you. It just depends on what you're inclined to do. I would suggest that anyone interested always kind of start out small and, and really get to know all those different opportunities. Um, for one example, you have to, if you don't have a, an area that's ventilated, you have to have exhaust fans because you don't want to inhale those fumes. So again, it has a little bit of, of uh, safety issues that need to be considered, but it is incredible medium. I just love it. Thank you. I'm gonna, I agree. And I was hoping you were going to mention the ventilation because that is definitely something important for people to know. Yes. You might want to try it. Well, we have five minutes. If anybody has anything else, type it or say it now. And we want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And thank you, Carolyn, for being with thank us. You. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. So my name is Tamar mm -hmm. Russell Brown from Gallery Sitka. We're in Shirley, Massachusetts. We're open by appointment. If you want to come by, certainly you're welcome to come by. Um, but this show is entirely online. So all the artwork can be seen at gallerysica.com forward slash harvest right at the top in the navigation. It's there. You can see the work. Tonight we interviewed Carolyn, excuse me, Carolyn Todd, who's local to Fitchburg area. Um, she's a Central Mass Women's Caucus for the Art member. Yay. <laughs> woo -woo. Woo -woo. As are most of the folks in the show. So next week, we're going to have a uh, Long Island, New York artist with us. Beth Berry will be back here at 6 p.m. and we'll interview her about her work. So we appreciate all of you joining us this evening and have a great weekend. Have a great Labor Day weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.